Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to all of you tuning in from around the world. I hope you are all doing very well. Uh, I'm Luke, uh, I'm a producer here at How To Academy and welcome to what I'm sure is gonna be a really inspiring and thought-provoking event. Today, we are very lucky to be joined by Daniel Goleman, PhD, author of five New York Times bestsellers. Daniel is best known for his paradigm-shifting global best-selling book, Emotional Intelligence, but his long-standing interest in meditation dates back to his two years in India as a graduate student at Harvard. His new book, Why We Meditate, The Science and Practice of Clarity and Compassion, written with Sokni Rinpoche, is out now. And that, of course, is why you're all here today, to learn from both ancient practices and empirical data in ways that may allow you to overcome destructive emotions and patterns of behavior, and, if we're lucky, bring inner peace and focus to your life. So after a 40 minute or so lecture, Daniel will take questions from you, the audience. So please type any you have in the little Q&A function, wherever it is on your screen, and I will get to them at the end. Well, that's more than enough from me. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Daniel Goldman. Daniel, over to you. Uh, Luke, thank you so much. And I'm delighted to be here at How To Academy. I like to talk about how to get better at anything with emotional intelligence and meditation as two cases in points. Consider this, there are four levels of mastery. The first, level one, you're clueless. You don't know you have shortcomings, you're oblivious. You need to understand that, that stage two, you see that, oh, I could get better at this. And that can be a motivation to change. And then the third stage, I'm working on it. You find a, a way to practice the skill, the target skill. And the fourth stage is you mastered it. It's automatic. That means that it's gone from your, the part of your brain, which uh, the prefrontal cortex, technically the executive centers, which manage something you, it takes an effort. It's become effortless. It means the basal ganglia, which is deep in the brain that handles all habits has taken it over. With emotional intelligence, there are four parts. Some of you may know this. The first is self-awareness. I know what I'm feeling. I know why I'm feeling it. I know how it's driving my emotions, my thoughts, uh, how it hampers or helps my performance. The second is managing those feelings, particularly if they're disruptive or distressing. Uh, and there are many, many ways to do that. But it's a crucial part of emotional intelligence. That's number two. The third is empathy, recognizing feelings in other people knowing what they're feeling without their telling us in words. People usually don't tell us in words. They tell us in tone of voice. They tell us in facial expression. So can you pick up the nonverbal cues and can you respond to the person as appropriate to how they're feeling? And the fourth is managing relationships, putting all of this together to handle relationships well. And uh, that in some is emotional intelligence. Now, let's look at a deficit. You know, the common cold of emotional intelligence is being poor at listening. We, you know, we're in a conversation, we're in a meeting, and we're preparing what we want to say. We're not really listening to what the other person is saying. And this, by the way, is very important. And its importance became so obvious during lockdown when so many meetings, for example, were in Zoom. The question is this, the most influential person in that dyad or in that group uh, looks away at key points. Do you look at your phone? Do you interrupt the person? If you do, it sends a message to that person and everyone else who's watching, which is you don't really care about the person. And new research is showing that the key to success in any team, any group is a sense of belonging. And you just, if you don't listen well, you just excluded that person implicitly. So how would you change that? Well, let's assume you're aware of it. So go to stage three, which is the critical one. This is where you practice and you think, well, you know, do I really wanna be like this? Where would I like to be in the future? Who would I like to be in five years say? And then you get a candid inventory. You ask friends whose opinions you trust, for example, uh, if you're uh, in an organization, you might get a 360 that look, where people rate you anonymously, but whose opinions you trust. Anyway, you get a profile of your strengths and limits 
across all of those domains of emotional intelligence. And then you connect where you could improve back to where you want to be. That's motivational. And you practice a new habit. So for poor listening, the new habit might be, you know, I'm going to stop myself. I'm going to listen to the person. I'm going to tell them what I think I heard them say, not parrot the words, but just in your own words. And then I'm going to give them my opinion or, or say what I think. That's a new habit, a new behavioral sequence in your repertoire. It's something you need to practice at every naturally occurring opportunity. And by the way, it could be at work or it could be with your teenager or your partner. It doesn't matter. The brain doesn't distinguish between any of these. So you practice wherever life gives you the opportunity. And that's how these habits change. And each of those habits builds what we call a competence in emotional intelligence. Now in January 2023, I've just launched an online platform for mastery in emotional intelligence with 12 competencies, each of them based in a particular part of that, uh, those four domains of expertise in emotional intelligence, self-awareness, self-management, empathy, relationships. Uh, and if you're interested in that, you can go to Key Step Media and they'll show you what to do. Key Step Media is one word and that's where those reside. So good luck if you're gonna go practice that. Now, I'm gonna go on to talk about meditation because I see meditation as kind of the equivalent of cardiovascular fitness in sports, but the equivalent for emotional intelligence for, or for all personal and interpersonal skill because meditation is a way of freeing up our attention, of giving us more command over it. And now I'm gonna draw on the book that's just come out in January, 2023. It's called Why We Meditate. And I wrote it with a friend of mine and a teacher, Sokni Rinpoche, who's a Tibetan Lama. He gives the theory and the practice from the Tibetan point of view, I give the science. And I'm not really qualified to give his part, so I'll focus on mine on the science and my why I meditate probably goes back to a traumatic experience I had my first year at university. I went to a very competitive uh, college, very hard to get into. I think well, I was a charity case. Anyway, everyone there practically had gone to what you would call a public school in the UK. Uh, just to confuse things, we call them private schools here, but anyway, uh, they all had had a course in calculus, but I had gone to what you would call a state school. I had actually never heard the word calculus. I actually had never heard the word prep school, which is what we call public schools in the US. Uh, I was quite naive and really unprepared. So it turned out there was a mandatory course my freshman year in calculus. And I remember freezing in my calculus exam that first semester, not being able to answer anything. I, I got a charitable D minus, which is just above a failing grade. Uh, and I think it made me very anxious about doing well or even surviving in school. So my first motivation for meditation was to calm down. Later, I got a postdoctoral fellowship to study in India, and there I had the opportunity to do what's called insight practice or Vipassana. It's come to the West as mindfulness. And I got very fascinated because I was a student in clinical psychology at the time. I was fascinated with uh, being able to change my relationship to my thoughts and my feelings, to see them come and go rather than being swept away in the stream. Uh, and for me, that was really a critical moment. And I became a little bit addicted actually to, uh, to that change. And that lasted for a while until I met some Tibetan lamas who seemed to be quite exemplary. I remember I met one very humble monk who uh, lived in a small, cubicle. He slept on a wooden bed that is, was also his daytime seat. You could come and see him anytime, day or night, and he was very beautiful. He was completely present. 
He was very loving. And I was coming to my famous professors at Harvard in psychology, and I realized that he was qualitatively different. And so I got very interested in the Tibetan practices because I thought, well, this is who I'd like to be when I grow up someday. Now, Sogni Rinpoche, who is a Tibetan Lama, comes from a family of people like that. His father was a famous meditation master. His three brothers, like him, are all meditation teachers. Chokinima, Mingyu Rinpoche, uh, and uh, he, his grandfather, great-grandfather, I believe, uh, founded a whole lineage in meditation. His grandmother was a master of it. At any rate, uh, it, it really appealed to me. And the first thing we talk about in the book, Why We Meditate, is dealing with ordinary worry, the kind of worry that I got into as a freshman in, in university. Uh, there are two kinds of worry. One of them is toxic. This is the kind of worry where we think about what's upsetting us over and over again, never come to resolution. You know, you wake up in the middle of the night and you're still thinking about it, or a week later, you're still having that same loop of thoughts versus very productive worry. This is where you deal with a threat or something that's upsetting or a challenge is coming your way. And you realize, well, I could take this step. I could do something. And so you drop it. That's called productive worry. But our brain, unfortunately, is wired, I think, in evolution to focus and fixate on those upsetting counterproductive worries. And I think the evolutionary reason was that knowing what was a threat and bringing it to mind over and over was actually probably a help to survive. So we pass this on in the design of the brain. And remember, the human brain was designed uh, in uh, most of evolution, which was previous to civilization. You know, the million years that the human brain was designed uh, happened long before we had recorded history. So we have this leftover, and it can lead, for example, to an emotional hijack where, say, uh, you feel today the threats aren't biological. It's not something that's going to eat us. It's something that threatens our dignity or our self-esteem. This guy's not treating me right. He's not being fair, for example. This can trigger an emotional hijack where the ancient parts of the brain take over uh, and we have a sudden flood of negative feelings. This is called an emotional hijack. And unfortunately, in those moments, we fall back on our overlearned responses. So your first impulse might be, I'm going to slug this guy. But if you're emotionally intelligent, other parts of the brain will come online and remind you, oh, this is your boss. So you're not going to slug him, smile and change the subject, whatever it may be. But one of the uh, methods that Sokni Rinpoche talked about, which I'd like to share with you, is a way of interrupting these destructive thought loops. It's called drop it. It's very simple. I'll show you. First, you put your hands in your air and you shake them like that. And then you drop them on your knee. And when you drop them, you just focus immediately on whatever sensations are in your body. And that, it turns out, stops that ruminative thought. It's a very positive uh, and powerful way to break the stream of negative thought. So it opens the door to the rest of meditation, which I'm going to share with you shortly. So let's try it together. If you are not too self-conscious, just put your hands in the air and get the energy going in them, shake them, and then drop. And that's the method. Now, from the Tibetan point of view, this is the beginning of dealing with what they see as a real affliction of modern life, speediness. Speediness, you know, we've got our to-do list, we've got our schedule, we've got some people are scheduled every 30 minutes, every hour, every 15 minutes, whatever it may be. And we're always thinking about the next thing and the next thing, that's speediness. And this is the beginning of slowing down. 
and in the book uh, Why We Meditate, Sotani Rinpoche gives several methods for dealing with speediness. One is called Vaz breath. It's a way of controlling your breath to slow the body down and to get more in touch with the natural rhythm. And this put me in mind of research that I'd seen on controlled breathing. You know, when you're in that emotional hijack state, when you're all worked up, it's what's called sympathetic nervous system arousal. And your heart pounds and uh, blood go goes from your organs to your limbs. It's known as the fight or flight or freeze response. But there's a powerful way to manage your breathing to, to get out of the sympathetic nervous system arousal and get parasympathetic arousal to get into the body's rest and recovery mode. This is actually even used by uh, military units when they're going to go into a tough situation, but it's we can all do it anytime. Uh, I've talked to uh, doctors during the uh, peak of the COVID uh, pandemic who were dealing with too many patients and too little resources and time uh, to, you know, every, anyone can find it useful. Anyway, it goes like this. Sometimes it's called four, four, four breathing. On the count of four, you breathe in deeply into your belly. One, two, three, four. You hold it for as long as is comfortable, at least the count of one, two, three, four. And then you release that breath for as long as you can, the count of one, two, three, four. So you breathe in, one, two, three, four. Hold, one, two, three, four. And exhale, one, two, three, four. And if you do this six to nine times, the research shows it shifts your body from that uptight, aroused state to a more relaxed state. Now.